Okay, so let's get started. Um, this month we're going to wrap up our three-month series of embedded programming with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I happen to have a Raspberry Pi 3, which we will show some stuff on. It really doesn't differ much from the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, the 3 has a slightly slower processor. We'll see a feature matrix in a second and has one gigabyte of memory instead of up to eight gigabytes that you can order for the four. So um, the Raspberry Pi, what is it really? Well, if we go over here to Wikipedia, let's make this a little bigger. Um, it's been around for a while. The first Raspberry Pi was released 10 years ago, uh, which um, they weren't numbering them then. It was just the Raspberry Pi. And there's since been a Raspberry Pi 2 and a Raspberry Pi 3 and a couple different models of the Pi 3. And there's a current model is the Raspberry Pi 4B, which comes in four different RAM configurations. You can get one, two, four, or eight gigabytes of RAM on the Raspberry Pi. Now, last month we talked about the Pi Pico, which is a $4 microcontroller. The Raspberry Pi is not a microcontroller it's a full computer system so it has non-volatile local storage it has a display it has USB ports for keyboard and mouse and it runs Linux so it's a f it's a full-blown computer you can certainly use Raspberry Pi and many people do as a small desktop computer it's obviously not going to be as powerful as a full-blown desktop computer with an NVIDIA GPU or an AMD GPU plugged into it or something like that but it is usable as a desktop computer we'll take a look at what the desktop looks like in a little bit um, it runs a <coughs> Debian distribution or Debian depending on how you like to pronounce it distribution of Linux that is called it used to be called Raspbian R-A-S-P-I-A-N but now they just call it Raspberry Pi OS um, it can run other operating systems including Windows um, <coughs> excuse me excuse me most people stick with the Raspbian OS that comes with um, it usually comes preloaded on an SD card that you can buy with a Raspberry Pi. If it's not preloaded, you can take any SD card and run a little Windows utility to re preload or to load rather uh, Raspbian distribution onto the SD card and then you plug in the SD card and boot from that. It's also possible to boot from USB. Now uh, as I mentioned, let's get this little thing out of the way. As I mentioned, there are different models and uh, like I said initially they had the Raspberry Pi and basically the the Raspbian Pi Raspberry Pi let's look at a little picture here so here are some diagrams that show the uh, layouts of the main connectors uh, and the and the chip so on the Raspberry Pi 4, you have a CPU-GPU combination, which is a system on a chip. So it's a single chip that contains everything that you need for a full computer except for RAM and networking and storage. So this system on a chip is a, uh, it's a, they've all been ARM Cortex processors, so they all are, are software compatible all up and down the family line. Uh, Grant is saying that the, the video is blurry. Let's see if I can increase. I've got it. Jitsi only gives me a setting for best performance or highest quality, and it's currently set on highest quality. Um, I've dropped my workplace VPN out of the loop to be as fast as possible but um, 
it's not going to be any better on Zoom. If you can't see it at decent video quality here, it's got to do with the network connection between you and me, and it's not going to be fixed by changing to a different broadcast software. It, I'm sorry. It is what it is. It's just the nature of video conferencing. The video on YouTube is recorded directly from my desktop screen, so it will be at best resolution. Uh, there, uh, it gives me limited control and jitsi over what I can do with the quality of the stream, and I have it set to the highest quality, so that's the best I can do. Sorry about that. Um, where were we? Okay, so we were talking about the fact that this is a single on, single chip, they call it a system on chip computer, and there's a uh, DRAM chip that provides anywhere from 1 to 8 gigabytes of DRAM. There is, on the Raspberry Pi 4, they have two USB 3 connectors, two USB 2 connectors, gigabyte Ethernet connector, and there's a single chip that does the uh, USB, that is the USB controller, another chip that is the Ethernet controller, and then it also has wireless networking, so it has 802.11.nb and g, I believe. We, well, we, you can look up the specs on Wikipedia, but basically, the current standards for wireless Ethernet. It also has Bluetooth and low power Bluetooth to interface with. Um, hardware devices that are Bluetooth capable. It has it uses a USB-C port purely for power. So this USB-C connector on the board does not actually do any data. It is simply used to provide power to the board. Um, it's also possible to use a uh, I think the older models I think it was possible to use a barrel jack for power. But one of the interesting things about the Pi 4 is that it has two HDMI ports that can display 4K resolution video at 60 frames a second. So that means you can drive. This is why people feel that the Raspberry Pi is perfectly capable to use as a desktop replacement because it can drive two displays at high resolution. You can connect keyboard and mouse over USB. It's running a desktop operating system. It has local storage in the form of a micro SD slot. That's the slot connector is located on the bottom of the board on the left hand side in this diagram. And if you uh, don't have wireless Ethernet, you can connect a cable through the RJ45 jack. If you have wireless, you can connect over wireless. If you need more storage or you don't want to rely uh, purely on the micro SD card for your data, you can use network attached storage or you can connect other storage devices over USB. USB 3 is quite fast for local storage. And it also has a, um, a barrel jack here on, on the uh, in this diagram. It's on the bottom near the right that is supplying stereo audio and it can also supply composite video. Composite video, not the greatest, but useful for connecting to say a TV or something like that if you have a legacy composite video device. Um, obviously HDMI is going to be better resolution and quality than composite, but the composite is there if you want to use that. That can be useful in certain situations. It also has these two ports here. You see labeled camera and display and there is a standard mobile hardware interface specification for connecting cameras and displays to you know for for things like you know small mobile devices like little handheld devices and things like that so you can connect up a touch screen instead of going over an HDMI cable to a monitor you can connect a touch screen and connect that to the display port you can connect a camera to the camera port and do applications that involve computer vision in a small package. And you can obviously you can connect both a camera and a display and have both. Now the <coughs> the thing that made it kind of interesting for the maker community 
is this 2x20 40 pin header on the edge of the board and that gives you general purpose I.O., I squared C, SPI, and UART interfaces. We've talked about these kinds of interfaces before when we talked about the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi Pico. So I won't recover that material again if you're unfamiliar with what those kind of interfaces look like and how the hardware interface looks. You can go watch those other videos on YouTube. So basically this is a full featured desktop and it's in a small package. Let's go look at a picture here. So this is a picture of the 2B but it, the boards are all very similar. You can see even from the from the 2B to the 4B the thing that's changed is you know the memory chip and they've got <coughs> a large size you know not a mini HDMI but a, a regular HDMI connector here and uh, if we look at my boards in a, a plastic case but if we take a look at my board for a second you can see that um, I've got the USB and the Ethernet jacks on the left and the uh, it might be flipping my image so I get, it might be on your right um, but I've got the USB jacks and I've got the oversized HDMI that's the way it was on the Pi 3 and a micro HDMI for a second display. So it's it's not very big. It's like the size of a large-ish credit card. Now, because it's small, and it can be uh, the the system on a chip can be uh, operated in such a way that it's not consuming a lot of power unless it's doing something. Uh, these systems on a chip are designed for mobile applications so they're pretty miserly about power consumption when they're idle that means you can have a Raspberry Pi in an enclosure powered off a battery and while it's not going to be as um, you know running as long as say a Raspberry Pi Pico which can be completely put to almost completely put to sleep drawing microamps when it's not doing anything you know that'll give you really long battery life <coughs> a Raspberry Pi will give you decent battery life, but you probably want to have it, you know, run off of some kind of power supply uh, with a battery to operate as backup when the main power supply is unavailable. So it's feasible to have a small, powerful computer that is running 24-7. It can be running in... Uh, Potentially remote environment and survive, you know, power fa brief power failures and brownouts. Exactly how long it's going to be able to run off the battery obviously depends on the capacity of the battery that you have connected and how long, um, or rather, how much work it is doing while it is running off the battery, etc. But suddenly, a lot of projects become interesting with the Raspberry Pi because you've got a full stack a full operating system for uh, a project and it is got full Wi-Fi connectivity so that means it can do things like be a web server it can send data over the internet it can be an internet of so-called internet of things type device where it's using its GPIO headers or additional peripherals attached to it to monitor the environment, interact with the environment, and interact with some network. So exactly what is on here, uh, for this is probably easier to go over here. Oh, I, should, I haven't mentioned the price point, but what kind of made the Raspberry Pi very interesting is it provided all of this from a price point of about $35. Now, if you <coughs> get the larger RAM size on the Fort B, you know, it's going to be a little bit more to get 8, gig, eight gigabytes of RAM versus one. But for $35, um, that's a very attractive price point. I mean, that's like, you know, these days, that's like three lunches, right? So that's not a lot of money. And uh, you won't feel bad if you accidentally, you know, connect up the wrong wires on the headers and burn one of these out. I mean, you still feel bad because you burned it out, but 
you won't feel like you you burned up hundreds of dollars you've burned up 35 so <clears throat> let's take a look at the data sheet so what's on there you've got a quad core 64-bit arm cortex a72 run this is for the raspberry pi 4 so it's running at 1.5.5 gigahertz now quad core that's good uh, Linux likes to run lots of little processes concurrently to do all of its little systemy things that is the architecture of Unix in general is to is, you know segregate different responsibilities into different processes so to have four cores available means that the system's going to be responsive uh, one two and four gigabyte options I think this spec sheet is a little bit stale I think currently you can get an 8 gigabyte option now because this system on a chip has an integrated GPU it can do H265 video decode and uh, H265 is the current uh, best standard for video encoding in terms of um, number of bits you need to achieve a certain quality H.264 is slightly older standard. H.264 is what is commonly used on Blu-ray. I, I think Blu-ray can also support H.265 when it's a f uh, 4K um, UHD Blu-ray. I think that is H.265 natively on the disc. And H.264 is uh, 1080p Blu-ray quality. Uh, MPEG-2, which is a previous standard, is what DVD uses. That's a higher bit rate for... Uh, you know in terms of if you think in terms of quality per bit it is for the same quality it takes more bits now it has a uh, 3d graphics processor incorporated into the system on a chip it supports OpenGL ES uh, I believe it is OpenGL ES 2.0 I'm not 100% certain on that, but it means it has 3D graphics rendering built in, accelerated on the system on a chip. And uh, it has enough power that it can, it can drive two HDMI displays at 4K, uh, 60 frames a second. Um, for networking, you've got 802.11, BGN, and AC. AC, I believe, is the, the current highest uh, bandwidth of variant of 802.11 so you've got that for wireless high data throughput you've got Bluetooth 5.0 with Bluetooth low energy support so that is um, Bluetooth support but without BLE is, is a low power version of Bluetooth support for talking to uh, your you know interacting with your phone or another Bluetooth capable device uh, it has an SD card slot and two micro HDMI ports for the displays, for dual displays, two USB 2, two USB 3, gigabit Ethernet port, the Raspberry Pi camera port. <coughs> on, the, on the Pi 4, it's a two lane um, MIPI, is this um, standards organization that define the camera and the display interface for mobile devices. So the CSI is the camera interface and the DSI is the display interface. The, the two-lane version is got more bandwidth available for the camera and for the display, so that means higher resolution camera sensors and higher resolution uh, displays. The Pi 3 just has a single lane uh, camera and display interface there. And 28 general purpose I.O. pins that can be configured as UARTs or I squared C or SPI. Um, SDIO interface is an interface used to talk to the uh, SD cards so, um, so that's configured to use the onboard SD card slot. There's also a um, parallel 24-bit RGB display port that you can configure the pins to use. Obviously, not all of these interfaces are available simultaneously. You have to configure the pins, uh, configure these 28 pins in 
various ways. I mean, this is a 24-bit parallel uh, display port here, so then only leaves four more pins left over for you to use, and even there, some of them are used by the Raspberry Pi itself, so you may not have any pins left over. I haven't um, specifically investigated the details of that, but... Um, uh, PCM... Uh, I was thinking PWM, so pulse width modulation channels we've talked about before. I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not sure what a PCM port is. Um, you've got uh, these GP clock outputs that allow you to route, uh, I believe that's allow you to route system clocks out to the pins. Um, the CPU, ARM V8 instruction set, uh, as I mentioned, it has a mature Linux stack that is available for the Raspberry Pi in terms of Raspberry Pi OS and it's the if you've if you've ever used a Unix system it's standard you know you use app get to install packages and so on and the package support is very good um, so you don't need to worry about compiling stuff from source usually whatever you need can be obtained just by searching for the right package and using apt-get to install the package like you would on any ordinary Linux desktop. Um, if you take a look at the product brief, so here's a... Well, okay, this will show you the dimensions of the board. It is 85 by 56 millimeters, so not particularly large. Um, Except for the SD card, all the components, uh, may, there might be a few passives that are on the bottom, but all the, the big components are on the top. Um, I don't think in this little product brief they show a picture of the bottom. But basically the only thing that's on the bottom is the SD card slot, and the SD card connectors are very thin. So when you get a case, like mine, I've just got a little transparent plastic case you can see here that, um, well, I guess you can't really, but if I tilt this, you can kind of see there's really not much going on underneath the board. It's, it's quite uh, small. So it's very compact, which is good for um, projects that don't have a lot of space. And you can e easily fit one of these in the glove box in your car if you want to have some kind of mobile thing in your car. You know, suppose your car doesn't have a uh, video server, you know, for the kids to watch movies in the back seat. No problem. You can put a Raspberry Pi in there, hook displays, you know, two displays up to it, and it could easily, you know, stream video from an SSD um, type device or even a hard drive connected over USB, stream that to the displays for watching movies, no problem. HDMI, you use the built-in audio on the HDMI, and not a big deal. I mean, it's going to obviously take some work to have those things set up in your car in such a way that it's going to be, you know, not a lot of weird wires around and stuff like that, but it's doable. Um, so, what does the desktop on the Raspberry Pi looks like? I have used a keyboard, mouse, and screen attached to my Raspberry Pi that I have used to install VNC, which is a remote desktop uh, service for Linux. I've got VNC running on the Raspberry Pi, so I can connect to that. So this is my the IP address of my Raspberry Pi on my local network, and it's logging in through VNC here. So now what you're looking at, this is the desktop of my Raspberry Pi. Um, it's got, you know, kind of standard desktop type things in here. It's using LibreOffice, so if you want to use Office type suites, that's available. I've got a little command prompt here. Let's see, there. Uh, so it's Linux, you know, I can take a look and see what processes are running and whatnot. So if I need to do C++ software development on the Raspberry Pi, uh, it comes with 
GCC G++ already installed. It didn't come with CMake, but you know it's simply a matter of saying here. Let me uh, make this font a little bigger for you. Instead of ten point, let's make it fourteen. Okay. So that's probably a little easier for you to read. Um, I have CMake on here now. It didn't come with CMake installed. I just did a you know sudo apt-get install CMake, and it says, "Oh yeah, it's already installed." Uh, so it's not difficult to get a compilation environment up on the Raspberry Pi. Now because of the fact that it's a complete Linux stack and we have full networking so we can run web servers on the Raspberry Pi which means I can have the Pi act as a server with clients connecting to it and having the Pi sending data back to clients or I can have the Pi act as a client and send data to remote servers so if you were to uh, pursue an Internet of Things type project where you've got some kind of sensor or some kind of actuator connected to the Raspberry Pi and you need to control that from a remote location you can set up a web server stack that allows you to control those devices remotely um, as long as you've got network connectivity to the Pi that is going to work just fine uh, in the reverse situation where you want the Pi to act as a client, you can use things like a uh, messaging system like MQTT or RabbitMQ. Uh, these are possible topics for a future talk, but we haven't we haven't covered them here. But if you're familiar with kind of Internet of Things style projects, you might be aware of these uh, messaging libraries that are out there. And the point of those is to, and you might think it's like, oh, what's the big deal? Why do I need a special messaging library? Why don't I just, you know, have the Raspberry Pi connect to some remote IP address over HTTP or whatever, uh, use a raw socket if you want, and just send data that way? Well, that certainly works for uh, small applications, but the advantage of a messaging infrastructure is you get things like the ability to publish data on multiple channels and have people subscribe to those channels and it, that's the so-called uh, pub-sub relationship, a publisher-subscriber relationship. That's easy to set up with packages like MQTT and in addition to that there are a lot of maker uh, oriented websites like Adafruit and others that provide um, the basically the cloud piece of an Internet of Things style project. So usually in an Internet of Things style uh, application, you've got some kind of cloud server that is acting as the thing that always has the data available even when the remote device that to which the sensors and actuators are attached is offline. And in the case of uh, network outages, a package like MQTT or one of these other messaging frameworks gives you the ability to um, have the messages get queued up locally and then when network connectivity is restored all the messages that have been queued up for delivery get delivered and then the connection is reestablished live so it can handle um, a lot of situations like that where especially if you have a device that can operate from battery backup if your power goes out um, chances are your home network, your 802.11 wireless network, has gone down. So the Raspberry Pi can be continuing to do its thing, uh, operating off the battery, and then when the network comes back online, it can transmit all the data that it's been accumulating while the network was offline. So it's very advantageous to have a full desktop stack available to you, Development environment is 
familiar if you're used to developing on Linux. Yeah, you, you know, it can be developing using VI or Emacs as your editor, or you can go all the way to an Eclipse IDE. Um, it's also possible to use cross compiling where you've got a fancy IDE on remote machine, but it is connected to the Raspberry Pi sharing source code or sharing binaries and you are doing essentially a remote debugging session where the remote target is the Raspberry Pi and the local GUI is running on your desktop. So lots and lots of options available to you because it is a full and rich environment. Um, now it is also entirely possible if you want uh, you don't have to use a VNC with a um, display interface what you can do also is just use let's see I need to I've never figured out how to kill this thing from inside so I just do it the hard way but it's also possible to um, if you want to you can just SSH into your Raspberry Pi. So here I've got a regular SSH connection talking to my Raspberry Pi. It's the same IP address. Um, the Raspberry Pi Raspbian or Raspberry Pi OS distribution by default has a user created Pi. The default password for Pi is Raspberry. I've changed mine. It's a good idea to change yours <laughs> if you get a Raspberry Pi so that um, it's not wide open because it's one of those well-known user password combinations. But I can just SSH into this machine. I don't necessarily need to have an X server running. So if I'm running VNC, a remote de the remote desktop connection that we were looking at earlier, I need to make sure that the X server is running and that you know all of the other infrastructure associated with running an X server is operating and you know, that obviously consumes more cycles, more power. If you're running off a battery, you may not want to do that. So you may have the X server disabled, but you're still going to need to be able to connect into the Raspberry Pi remotely so you can use a secure shell SSH connection to do things as well. Now, I'm, this is just running, you know, just giving me a command prompt. Obviously, I don't, uh, if I'm not running VNC or, a dis or even a display server like x11 I can't do any graphical things but I can do whatever else I need to do just to access things from the command line so the next question might be okay how does Linux expose this little GPIO 2 by 20 header over here and if you've never done yeah that uh, and done any of that sort of thing in Linux the answer is a there's a file system type called sysfs sysfs and what sysfs does is it takes all of the device information that is registered with the Linux kernel and exposes it as files in the file system so on the Raspberry Pi, you will have in uh, that file system is typically mounted in slash sys. So if you look in slash sys, you see there's some directories. Eh, let's do it this way so you can see that they're directories. All of these directories at, underneath slash sys represent different views of the set of devices that the Linux kernel knows about. So in the block directory are all the devices that are so-called block devices. These are things like your your hard drives, your storage, your storage uh, media partitions, and so on. Under bus is all the buses that are registered with the Linux kernel. Under class are all the different classes of devices that are registered. Now, because every block device, for instance, registers itself as a device of a class storage it's not to say that all of the entries underneath here underneath this directory tree are unique because a single device will expose um, 
a variety of attributes that represent the characteristics of the device and so it may have it'll have an entry under class it'll it you know a block device will have an entry under block it'll have an entry under class and so on the the details of all of this are described in various Linux documentation sites that describe the SysFS in general, how everything works. But for us, what we're interested in to get at these GPIO pins is under SysClass, there is a GPIO folder. So if we CD into SysClass GPIO, and we look inside here, and we see that, first of all, there's this file called export, another file called unexport, and then there's two sim links that link out of this directory structure up into the devices folder. And basically this GPIO chip 0 and GPIO chip 504, these represent the GPIO resources that are provided by the system on a chip. So you'll notice here it even says SOC. And the way that this works is first you have to configure the GPIO pin um, and configuring the pin amounts to doing things like saying is this pin configured for output? Is it configured for input? Is it configured with an internal pull-up resistor or possibly an internal pull-down resistor? And there's lots of details on how to do that. Um, the unfortunate thing about programming these GPIO pins uh, for an embedded developer compared to the Raspberry Pi Pico, which has a very sophisticated C++ SDK, and compared to the Arduino Uno, which has a simplified programming environment with built-in libraries for addressing all the pins, there doesn't seem to be any official C++ SDK from the Raspberry Pi Foundation for programming the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. There's an unofficial library called Wiring Pi and you uh, if you're going to use that it, it's very similar it provides a programming API that's very similar to the Arduino programming API. Um, there's a bit of melodrama associated with this library because if you go to the place that a lot of the, the guy that originally wrote it created it had it on his website he was maintaining it and over a period of time he became overwhelmed with supporting it and got tired of all the people constantly pestering him with questions and so he uh, completely backed off the project. He doesn't host the source code anymore. He won't answer any questions. He's got a grumpy blog post where he declares the library to be deprecated. Um, the end result is that the last version that he published has been forked into GitHub and there's people maintaining it independently on GitHub and that's kind of the one that you want to get. So if you start investigating how to program these things from C++ and people suggest wiring pi and then some other people say wiring pi is deprecated that's the little bit of drama around that whole story it's not deprecated in the sense that it doesn't work it's deprecated in the sense that the original author doesn't maintain it anymore that doesn't make it deprecated in my eyes it just means he doesn't support it um, it wouldn't be the first project where the source code was handed off from one maintainer to another and the original maintainer says you know I don't have anything to do with that anymore go talk to somebody else that doesn't mean the source code is deprecated or the API is deprecated it's an unfortunate choice of words uh, in his blog post but if you google around this wiring pi library you'll you'll find people claiming that it's deprecated and so on but what does that wiring pi library really do um, if we go back out here uh, wrong window if we go back here to github and then we search for a wiring pi we go out here and 
uh, this guy Gordon is the original author, but, you know, this is the unofficial mirror because, you know, the official mirror is the one that he maintained and deleted. So you can't go to the official one anymore. Anyway, if you look inside here, we look inside Wiring Pi, and we look at the main C file. Um, maybe that, okay. This might not be the the best way to look at it. Um, okay, so this API pin mode, digital read, digital write, uh, analog read, analog write. This is very similar. Sorry, that font size may be a little small. Let's make it bigger. This API is very similar to the Arduino library API, and that's what this library was designed to do, was to give you a way to access the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi using an API that's familiar to you if you've been using Arduino. But what does it really do under the covers? What it really does under the covers is it opens up those files in slash sys and uh, in particular in slash sys slash class slash gpio it opens up those special files and you control the behavior of those gpio pins by writing values to the files that control the configuration parameters and then you can read values from other special fires files once the pins are configured to obtain input data or you can write values to the special files once the pin has been configured to send data out on the pins now to give you an, a, an example of what this looks like um, another class that is in here that you might have noticed is this LEDs class Sorry for the low contrast there. I don't get to choose the colors that are used by Bash by default, and I, I haven't taken the time to turn them off. Um, but if we look in LEDs, we have a special file called LED0 and LED1. And if you want to... Let's turn my little embedded camera on so you can see this. Okay, right now you can see that there's an... One of my LEDs is on, or the red one. There's a green LED that is off. And the way that we can change these is if we go into LED 0 and we take a look inside there, there's a, I will, you can see there's a plain file here called brightness. And if we cat that, I have to actually do it as sudo. I, I'll mention briefly why do I have to do sudo because hardware resources in Linux are not typically accessible um, raw hardware resources are not typically accessible by code that runs in user space uh, without privileges so I in order to access these special files I have to access them uh, if I'm doing plain shell commands to tickle the files I have to do that using sudo so if we cat the brightness, we can see that it's 0 for LED 0. So that means LED 0 is off. And if I go back here to LED 1, sudo cat, let's just show you that I have to do it. Maybe I don't, maybe to cat it, I don't need to be sudo, but to write it, I do. What happens if I sudo cat brightness? Same value. Okay. But if I try to change it, it says permission denied. So now I have to say, um, just for simplicity's sake, I've got a file that contains a zero, so I don't have to do weird shell quoting with the indirect, the, the redirect. So I can just say sudo cat, or sorry, cp temp zero to brightness. And now the LED is off. I can, I also have a file that's got a 1 in it. So if I say sudo copy 1 to LED 0 brightness, 
Now the green LED is on. So when this wiring pi library runs, all it's doing is doing f open on these magic files in sys class gpio the the first place it starts are these uh, magic files called export and unexport so you write a value into the export file in order to configure a gpio pin and export its configuration settings into the sysfs slash sys slash class slash gpio directory and once you've exported a pin then its configuration files magically appear in the file system then you can write values to those configuration files to change the behavior of the pin and you can use those magic files to read and write data to and from the GPIO pins. And as you might imagine, that's kind of slow in, in relative terms. Because, well, first of all, it, it, it should make you nervous that you have to run these programs as sudo if you're going to configure any of these values. That means it's a potential security hole because your program's running as sudo. Um, and I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen any examples that do the standard Unix server kind of thing where they use the sudo privileges at the beginning in their startup to configure the necessary state and then they, they drop down to plain user level access. I don't know if that would work with the GPIO pins. I don't know if you have to have the sudo privileges when you write the value versus just opening the file for writing. I haven't investigated that. But as you can see, that's, you know, that, that's concerning enough that I have to use sudo from a security perspective point of view. I mean, yeah, it's a little Raspberry Pi. Who cares if it gets compromised, right? But if this Raspberry Pi is connecting to other servers on the internet as a trusted device, then certainly I do care about the vulnerability of my little Raspberry Pi. Um, we don't need this little inset camera now, so let's turn that off. The next difficulty is that this is obviously not going to be a high bandwidth operation because I'm writing these little ones and zeros to these little configuration files or these little special files after the pins have been configured. And, um, you know, how fast can I do that? Linux is not a real-time operating system. It makes no guarantees about performance. There's a, a process scheduler that's constantly interrupting all the processes and giving time slices out. And there's all the system daemons running, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for some kind of high bandwidth operation, you may not be able to service the data fast enough using these magic files. Your next option is to write a kernel device driver. That would give you more control over the hardware directly accessing it. It's obviously not a trivial topic. We've never given a presentation on writing a Linux device driver, but it has a lot of um, constraints on the kind of code that you can write that will run in the Linux kernel, even if you're only running it on your kernel. You can't do everything, uh, or, or rather, you can't just do anything. You have to operate within the constraints of code that is executing in the Linux kernel. So usually what people do, if they have some kind of, you know, high bandwidth type device or, you know, some kind of timing sensitive device that they need to interface to the Raspberry Pi, is instead of bit banging the GPIO pins to that device directly from user code or user code running in, a sudo environment on the Raspberry Pi, what you do is you put a smart processor to talk to that sensor or talk to that actuator and then have the smart sensor communicate at a higher level to the Raspberry Pi. And a common thing to do is to use an Uno or a Pi Pico to handle those tasks, offload the Raspberry Pi, and then instead of talking to the Raspberry Pi uh, 
over a low-level GPIO interface, if you're using a Raspberry Pi Pico, it can be doing some kind of high bandwidth activity and communicating to the Raspberry Pi over USB. And the USB will have enough bandwidth um, for most devices to uh, USB 3 has a lot of bandwidth. Uh, the Pi Pico can do a USB 1.1. So if you're going to use Pico off the shelf with no additional hardware, the little $4 board, it, the USB interface that's on there is USB 1.1. So if it's within the bandwidth supported by 1.1, you can certainly just connect it up to the USB port on the Pi and let the USB drivers deal with whatever your data stream is. If you're using uh, an Uno for your you know, kind of real-time control inner loop, there is, um, we haven't talked about extension boards for the Raspberry Pi, but this 2x40, sorry, 2x20 40, 40 pin header on the Raspberry Pi is basically designed for adding extension boards. They call them um, uh, Pi hats. Uh, some so you might have see it referred to as a fat a p h a t um i think that the h a t stands for like hardware attached on top or something like that but basically the common terminology is that they are called hats and there's a common hat for the raspberry pi called the gert board which gives you a lot of digital i o on some analog i o you notice that um one of the things that was missing when we went over the features of the hardware supported by the system on chip for the Raspberry Pi is that there was no analog to digital converter like there was on the Pi Pico and like there was on the Arduino. So if you need analog signals coming in that you need to do something with, you need to sample them. You can't do that straight with the Raspberry Pi out of the box. You need additional piece of conversion hardware. Um, so these hat boards allow you to offload the low level maybe timing critical or bandwidth sensitive processing onto a piece of basically a piece of co-processing hardware that talks to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, in the chat the question is if I'm writing certain pins directly from Linux would I then have to wait for the other device to read them and do all sort of fancy hardware acknowledgements ACNAC type stuff that basically makes it very difficult or impractical. Um, yes that that is in when I mentioned it as bit banging an interface, that's exactly what you have to do. If there's some sort of hardware communication protocol to acknowledge and uh, received of data or do, you know, if you're even doing very low level digital logic, things like chip selects and so on, you have to orchestrate all those level transitions yourself on the various pins. And you can imagine if there's a timing constraint between two pins as part of this interface and you have to meet that timing constraint it may not be possible to do that reliably under Linux because your process can get interrupted. So this would be in an area where the Pi Pico would be able to handle all of that um, much more reliably especially if you use the PIO state machine blocks on the Pico. Uh, in the chat, so so Pico has all of that handled under C++. Um, you can watch our Pico presentation from last month, and yes, you can program everything in the Pico using C++. They have an extensive SDK of functions that allow you to control all the peripherals without having to um, get too low level, shall we say? You know, you're not you, you don't have to. go all the way down to bit banging and interface most of the time. And even on the Raspberry Pi, uh, let's see, I think it was in the data sheet. Um, okay, so even on the Raspberry Pi, these GPIO pins, they can be configured as a UART, which is basically a serial port, or they can be configured as I squared C interfaces or SPI interfaces um, and I squared C and SPI are interfaces that allow two chips to talk to each other so using an SPI interface or 
uh, an I2C interface, it's possible to connect a sensor directly up to the the Pi, and then instead of it um, instead of manipulating that interface through the let's get back over here. Uh, if we go up here, instead of the GPIO, you'll see that there's also an I squared C device folder. It, it doesn't have anything in it at the moment because I haven't configured any of the GPIO pins to operate as an I squared C interface. But you've got the same sort of facility, but now because you're through, through these uh, magic files in uh, SysFS, the sysfs file system exposes all the these files as these uh, exposes all the devices as these files and directories uh, yes Paul or Paolo you've got your hand raised uh, I was having difficulty hearing people on audio so if you want to type your question in the chat then I can get that way oh he says, sorry, I clicked by error. That's fine. Um, so these are, you know, a serial port or I squared C or SPI. If you have a sensor or an actuator that can talk uh, SPI, then it can be, the GPIO pins can be configured as an SPI interface. And then using the SPIO interface, you can talk at a slightly higher level than banging out individual bits. And that can relieve you from having to try and uh, match the timing constraints for an interface because the interface is already supported directly in the hardware so the hardware once those pins are configured to use that interface will meet the timing constraints for sending and receiving data over that interface when talking to a sensor or an actuator so really um, bit banging the individual levels or the, the individual pins that's kind of your option of last resort um, but if you have some kind of custom interface or custom circuitry that you've created, that may be the way that you need to go. And if the timing is difficult to meet or the uh, data rate that you need to maintain is in excess of what you can reliably maintain manipulating these special files, then, you know, a Pi Pico at $4.00 is certainly an attractive uh, coprocessor that you can have talking to the low-level hardware and turn that into higher-level messages that are sent to the Raspberry Pi. So you really kind of want to think of the Raspberry Pi as, like I said, it's just really like a small desktop computer. Um, but Linux is not being a real-time operating system, can't make timing guarantees when you do communication of protocols in software as, a, as an algorithm. So you have to take that into account. Um, so that gives you an overview of the Raspberry Pi. And um, if, if you've used uh, Linux or any kind of Unix environment before, it's going to be very familiar to you. It's um, very easy to develop. Um, I mean, you know, if you're OK with developing over SSH and you don't need the full graphical display, you can easily develop remotely on this thing. Developing on it natively is also, you know, quite comfortable because you can just hook up any HDMI capable uh, monitor or pair of monitors directly to the Pi and a regular USB keyboard and mouse. And now you've got a full desktop environment. Now, do you want to be doing something like compiling Qt, which if you're familiar with it is a very large source package do you want to be compiling that natively on the Raspberry Pi? Probably not. But that's the advantage of the package system is that it's uh, al almost all the things that you're going to use that need to be built before you can use them have already been built and packaged up in a distribution uh, in, through an apt-get server. So you can just download those packages, install them, and start consuming them right away. Now, it's also, if your particular application has a lot of source code in it, you know, that can mean that just trying to build that all by itself, your application on the Raspberry Pi could get burdensome. I mean, sure, it's got a quad core ARM Cortex A7 in there, but it's still not going to be as fast as your beefy PC desktop. So 
in that situation you probably want to set up cross compiling so that you're uh, building on your desktop but compiling for the Raspberry Pi as the target and then moving the built binaries over the network onto the Raspberry Pi for execution there. Um, as I was researching this for this presentation I was running across instructions for how to do this with Visual Studio Code and how to do this as well with just plain old Visual Studio and I think that might be uh, a topic for a future meeting uh, cr just the, the whole process of cross compiling in general and using the Raspberry Pi as the target would be a good uh, example because we could because it's a full desktop environment we can see things interactively from the Raspberry Pi side as well as what it looks like from the Windows side under Visual Studio but it's uh, a lot more than we have time to go into tonight so do we have any other questions before we wrap things up And again, I haven't been able to get the audio to work, so we'll have to go with questions in the chat. Sorry. I'm not seeing any other questions, so... I think that's going to wrap it up for this month and uh, I'm not sure what the uh, next group of talks is going to be but um, I'll try to get something announced in the next week or so so we don't have to wait a long time uh, this question in the chat says I have a ten dollar Raspberry Pi something W is that a Pico um, there if, if we go back here to the Wikipedia page you will see that there is a the Raspberry Pi Zero. The Raspberry Pi Zero is uh, here's an example of the Raspberry Pi Zero Two W. It's about half the size of a Raspberry Pi. You notice it doesn't have as many of the uh, interfaces as a as a full Raspberry Pi. It's not the same as a Pico. You can see the Pico pictured here above it on Wikipedia. Uh, the Pico we covered last month. The Pi Zero is basically a reduced cost Raspberry Pi that has wireless networking, but it does not have wired networking. So you notice there's here's the SD card slot, and here's the uh, USB connectors, and here's uh, I believe this is either a camera or uh, display connector and it has um, so the Pi Zero has wireless networking it does not have wired networking but it still is a full Raspberry Pi and it still runs Linux the Pico does not run Linux in the Pico you compile your code and it is the operating system your application there's no operating system per se there's an SDK for the Pico that gives you an abstraction layer for the hardware access but it is not it's not an operating system per se it doesn't have like there's no disk there's no scheduling there's not none of that it's just the main function of your program is what the Pico runs when you boot it and so your main function runs basically in an endless loop uh, but the Pi Zero is a full Raspberry Pi so it does run Linux and it has a full networking stack. It has Wi-Fi networking only. It does not have wired networking. But you can attach, uh, I believe these, the, yeah, so you've got two micro USB connectors. Uh, I believe this is a micro HDMI connector. And then this is the SD card slot. And here's your system on a chip. And this is the uh, wireless networking in this little can. And then over here, this is either a... Uh, camera or display port in the feature matrix it probably says so the Pi Zero the Pi Zero W you notice that there's the zero and then there's the zero W and there's a two W the, with the all the ones with the W have wireless networking 
they have the same 40 pin header that's available for everybody it has uh, half a gig of RAM so less amount of RAM it does not have Ethernet so no wired networking but wireless networking only um, oh I didn't mention it but the 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 Pi, you might be thinking like, you know, I don't want to buy one of these things and then just, you know, it sits on my shelf for a couple of years before I get a chance to go use it. And then I'm, you know, worried by the time I get around to using it, it might be out of date. Um, the, the Pi 4, I believe, has guaranteed support until uh, 2029. And like my, um, I have a Pi 3B Plus and I believe the support for that is like until guaranteed until like 2023 uh, so th they work very hard to make these things backwards compatible so all the newer Raspberry Pis are fully backwards compatible software and hardware wise with this 40 pin header so your investment in hats and your investment in software continues to function going forward as they come out with new models of the Raspberry Pi and um, so if for some reason your old Raspberry Pi you know you know gets un becomes unsupported and then doesn't um, you know the latest distribution doesn't work anymore for whatever reason swapping to a newer Raspberry Pi is not a big deal it's not a big expense and your investment in software and hardware will continue to work so they're pretty good about keeping things working and, and supporting everything so um, we'll end it there and uh, thanks for coming and we will see you next month